Let's do it. No agenda. <coughs> no agenda. No agenda, okay. man. Let's just roll. All right. Uh, before we get started, mm -hmm. I brought you a snack. Mm. But Thank you've you only much. got one, so time it wisely. Thank you very much. And no, we're not sponsored by Oreo. <laughs> Although, that would be a good client. There we go. <laughs> awesome, man. Um, so, firstly, when you finish chewing, <laughs> do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? For anyone who's never seen oh, yeah, sure. the famous Steph from Megaphone. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, I am the famous Steph from Megaphone. Um, I am the head of digital, so I run, I mean, I run, I manage the, um, all the paid um, and performance channel um, teams. So the meta team, the Google team, the SEO team, and then any programmatic campaign that we have, anything digital out of home or anything else. Uh, and then th that's part of my job. And then the biggest part of my job is um, digital innovation and product development and making sure that we're always ahead of the curve, one step ahead of everyone else, which means also um, platform adoption, um, well, leading the charge with the AI and the integrations that um, with Pixels and anything else, um, data analysis, and also mentoring and I guess challenging people mm -hmm. to think about what we do in different ways. Um, that's probably one of the things that I do the most and probably the thing that I enjoy the most as well. It's just um, a lot of what I do for myself is making sure that I'm always questioning myself and questioning the status quo of what we do. Um, otherwise, this industry becomes very, you know, methodical. Uh, so I try to have, I try to foster that culture with everybody where whatever you did yesterday might not be good tomorrow. Um, and like, that's, that's a lot. Sounds what like you do a lot. Is a yeah, lot you're responsible yeah. for a lot of things, all the innovation, platform updates, training the team. Training the team, platform updates, um, and looking for new opportunities, new, new platform, new services, new, uh, new offering, or like better and improved uh, offering, uh, even just sometimes challenging everything that we've done even if we've done it for a long time mm -hmm. and it has worked, just challenging it anyways to see if there is any gap that we have not thought about, that we should be thinking about, that we should be looking at to see what's the next evolution of whatever we do. I think part of what I do, a lot of what I do is make sure that we are always evolving in the right direction. Sometimes I, you know, I always have to make, I also have to make sure that people are following. That's probably one of the things that I struggle the most, but I, that, that's like, that's who I, have, who I am at the core. Um, and I'm bringing that to the team and I'm bringing that to the, to the agency in itself. Just the core of what, I, of what I am is questioning everything, challenging everything. Whatever problem we have today, we might solve it. It doesn't mean that that's a final solution. Every solution to a problem should always be challenged, should, mm -hmm. al should always be reviewed. We should always be finding new solutions to all problems. Um, and that's about 80% of what I do. You're a problem solver, absolutely. Yeah, a problem finder as well. Find the problems first, solve them after. Uh, cool, so, Steph, let's start with this. Got a little surprise for you. Oh, wow. So, you're a man who, I think, knows a lot about a lot of different topics. Mm -hmm. So, we're gonna spin the wheel, and whichever platform it lands on, I want you to tell me what is the future of that part of marketing. Oof. I think I've got a lot more to say on Meta. There you go, Meta, meta. perfect. All right. Let's Second try. Get rid of this. <laughs> so, Steph. Oof. Okay. I, I just want to pick your brain a little bit because there's a lot of talk in the world of digital marketing these days about mm -hmm. cookie-less worlds and zero-party data and how everything is changing and people are a bit nervous about yep. what is coming. And then, of course, there's the whole conversation around AI and the immense number of different softwares and technologies that they come and they go, some stay, some are more fads, but some are actually making a, a significant difference yeah, in the way we yeah. market. So I'll, I'll start broad. Where, where do you think, in terms of meta, the future of digital marketing is going towards? Where are we at now and, wh and where do you see it transitioning toward? Um, there's a lot of talk about privacy policy and cookie lists and all of that. 
There isn't as much talk about zero-party data or any of that, to be honest. Um, there should be more. Mm -hmm. um, where we are is a transition period, but also we've been in this transition period forever, so it's not really a transition period anymore. Like, uh, um, the privacy has been a, a, a huge topic for years. Um, of, of course, massive milestone um, in, the, in the entire privacy policy journey has been the ATT and iOS 14. That was huge, that was big, that was a few years ago, and um, it highlighted certain shortcomings um, and certain, it, it forced business to think about advertising in a different way. Um, second big milestone was the announcement that Google was going to deprecate third-party cookies that eventually became the announcement that they're not going to deprecate them anymore, mm -hmm. that might be deprecating them in 2025. There's a lot to talk about there, a lot to uncover, which I won't get to. There's a lot of, um, you know, questions about Google Sandbox privacy sandbox, how private is the privacy sandbox and so on, which is not really worth talking about. But um, one thing that definitely has been, has, has, um, has come up a lot is the fact that as businesses were not ready for iOS 14, mm -hmm. they're still not ready today. They're still not ready for a cookie deprecation possible timeline that has been announced so many times and has been moved forward so many times and a lot of business, businesses are still not ready. And it's not just a small, you know, electrician down the road that is running Facebook ads or Google ads. It's also big enterprise businesses that just have not thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, some are. It's not that not a, not a nobody thought about it. Some businesses are prepared, but not a lot of them are. And when I mean, when I mean thinking about it and talk and uh, preparing is not just definitely investing in tools. Um, they're investing in zero-party tools, first-party data tools, CEDPs, um, different type of tracking, server-side, so many things. Mm -hmm. There are so many technologies, so many options available. Um, zero-party data is probably one of the most overused terms mm -hmm. in like the last quarter and the beginning of this year. Well, well, what does it mean to you for, for those who are you know, maybe only hearing about this cookie-less world yeah. for the first time, who, who are kind of well, for us, about the change. Like, what, what is zero-party data versus first-party data, and, and how can we yeah, really, okay. like, simplify this idea that, that seems quite uh, complex? It is very complex. <laughs> <laughs> when we're talking about, when we're trying to, uh, when we talk, when we're trying to translate technology into, or articulate technology into, like everyday words, it it is quite complicated. The main difference is that. Um, uh, third-party cookies, the way third-party cookies have worked and always worked, were by uh, literally dropping a cookie on browsers, um, and that's called browser-side tracking. Zero-party, first-party server-side are a type of tracking that doesn't rely on cookies without getting way too, you know, jargony and complicated. Um, it is the, 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 the natural... Um, evolution of that technology where instead of relying on dropping a cookie that follows you around the web, um, we rely on server-side tracking, tagging, uh, and collecting certain information from, um, from users mm -hmm. um, in a privacy compliant way that allows us to um, track and attribute conversion events without getting into privacy um, issues or limitations as in the past. What it means to us is, well, what it means to the industry in general is a few things. One thing is we need to invest in these tools so that we have more reliable data into the ad account, but also we shouldn't be looking at these tools as the only solution because attribution is still going to be a solution no matter what, an issue no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what technology you use, you can have the best third-party attribution tools, you can have the, the best tagging, you, the best zero-party attribution is always still going to be an issue. Um, and that's simply because of the reason platforms are built, especially with the, with, with the, the more AI gets used into platform, the more statistical measurement gets used, the more attribution, like the old school attribution, like Apple for Apple, like mm -hmm. one, one purchase on Meta equals one purchase on a website that's not happening anymore. So what really businesses should be thinking about is 
measure impacts of their campaigns outside, not only within the platform or within analytics, but also outside it, um, start thinking about uh, looking at the bigger picture. Mm. The, the, so when you say look at the bigger picture, there is a, I'm sure you could give me a list of a lot of things to do, but, but where do we start? If you're, if you're having this conversation with a new Megaphone client tomorrow who wants to make sure that their data is as accurate as possible moving forward and also is protectable in the event that we do enter this new wave of privacy yeah. rules, where do you get people to start to make sure that they're ready for the changes that can come? I mean, the first step is invest in technologies. So the first step is get yourself a zero-party data tool or a first-party data tool. Do you have a favorite? Well, I do like, I'm not going to mention them. <laughs> <laughs> off, off you can chop that part. Yeah. Whoop, back on. Um, invest in, a, in, a, in zero party data tools, invest in solid technologies. Like, it depends on the business that you're running and what your CMS is, what your website platform is, and so on. You can go from using uh, CEDPs that are you know, extremely advanced and extremely expensive, that do everything for you, that connect all of your, connect all of your data sources to all of your advertising platform, to as simple as making sure that, for example, on Meta, your conversion API is working mm -hmm. and is connected properly. Now, if you're on, uh, on a platform like Shopify, that's probably happening more likely than not. Um, but also making sure that that's, that's good enough. Um, your match quality is decent. You have a good match quality on Meta. Um, and that the quality of your tracking is there. So again, you can invest into data tools that can cost you $100 a month as much as $1,000 a month. It, really, it depends on your business. The problem is that that conversation is not starting. Mm -hmm. It's not about choosing, like a lot, of businesses, a lot of businesses are not in the phase where they have to choose a platform. They are in the phase where they have, they're still trying to understand why they need a platform like that. Mm -hmm. Like I see... Well, well, tell me, why, why do we need that? Is, is it inevitable that these changes are coming? Well, it is inevitable, but also the fact that independently from the changes coming or not, uh, I think that's probably one thing that has happened quite a bit since the deprecation of the, the, the announcement of the deprecation of cookies is that all of a sudden, it's like if without cookies, um, everything will fall apart. Mm -hmm. The reality is that every other browser but Google has already deprecated cookies, like years, mm -hmm. years in the past. Um, Apple has been operating without cookies since the ATT. Uh, so this is just the last piece of the puzzle. It's just um, the biggest piece. It's, the bi it's a yeah. big piece. It's, it's, a, it's a very important piece. I wouldn't say it's as big as, big as the iOS, because when the iOS 14 was released, there wasn't anything else. When Google, um, Google is a big, it's a big environment, so they, you know, they've invested in a sandbox and when they're on privacy sandbox and so on. It's also a different world. Like AI wasn't as utilized in the past, mm. when now we can rely on AI and statistical modeling and so on, and so on to cover some of the gaps. So it is definitely a better position today than it was, you know, when the ATT was a reality. Um, but for me, the fact that since the, AT, the, the iOS 14 to today has been years, and we're still in the same the same spot. Mm -hmm. That means, do we need to actually wait for cookies to be deprecated to start thinking about it? Uh, like the majority of the issues that the deprecation of cookies is highlighting were things that we've been living with for a while. And we, I feel like a lot, the, the, the majority of the industry is thinking about ways that we can try to get the tracking that we used to have instead of thinking about ways that we adapt to the fact that this is the new era of advertising and this is how it is. Um, so definitely investing in platform that's important anyways. That's something that you should have anyways. Uh, even just because you might not be able to get attribution even, uh, not even like extremely accurate attribution, but at least you make sure that whatever data comes to your advertising is the correct one and is not um, He's not wrong or skewed data. Yeah, and, and what's the, the chain reaction if you do have skewed data from a business perspective? Well, uh, the, the entire point is bringing data to uh, platforms means training the algorithm in a certain way to go in a certain direction mm -hmm. rather than bringing skewed data that will train the algorithm to go in a different direction. So really, that would be the main focus. Like when you invest into zero party or first party data is to make sure that you're controlling that data, but also that you can connect your different sources. So you can connect your, you know, your CRM to your advertising platform in a privacy compliant way. So do you, you know that the, the goal shouldn't be 
oh, that it shouldn't be that that means that we are going to have one purchase on Meta today. It's going to be equal to one purchase on Shopify today mm -hmm. uh, because you still have cross-channel attribution. You still have overlapping and so on. That's not going away. But at least you have better data going into the platforms. And that data um, educates the algorithm to work in a certain direction while you look at the bigger picture. And looking at the bigger, pic bigger picture looks means look outside that single platform or attribution platform that you're using like GF4 or Triple Whale or Hyrus or whatever. Those are all great, but if the narrow vision is something that we cannot allow to have anymore. Um, again, years ago, you would run a campaign on Meta, you would run a campaign on Google, you would have pretty much matching conversions. Mm -hmm. We're still trying to, it's like, it feels like sometimes businesses or brands, they are, there's a lot of, there's always been a lot of frustration around the inability to attribute accurately. Uh, like if we could do something about it, when in reality we should just stop getting frustrated and adapt to it and understand that we should look at it in a different way. Um, looking at the business, I'm going to use the word holistically. Um, I hate the word because it's the most overused word in but marketing. It, it is important though, because that's that's the point of all this, this data, the, right? Yeah, to, that's the whole show point. Where your customers are coming from, how you can target the right people to buy from your store and to make sure that you're not putting your money, your budget, your spend to the wrong people. Yeah, but of course, and, and data is one part of that, but you cannot look at, we cannot look at tracking as the single solution. Of course, if you're running, a, 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 um, let's say, a service business and your conversion action is when a user lands on a thank you page, then you have a data problem. Mm -hmm. Like that is, and again, we fall trap of that as well because sometimes it is the only solution, but that is, that is probably the first thing that you should be doing, like making sure that you move to something a little bit more reliable. And it is interesting to see how so many businesses still have these kind of things. Like you still have a lot of businesses relying on Google Tag Manager, page view event, triggering on a page view for a thank you page or for a confirmation page um, and only tracking that without collecting any information whatsoever, without you know, they might have these massive forms where they're collecting the email, the name, zip code, phone number, and everything. Mm -hmm. All this data that could actually be used to send back in a, in a privacy compliance way through different platforms or even just through manual tagging, send it back to the, ad, to the ads manager to match those to users and increase your match quality. And instead, we are sending them to a thank you page, which means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that is, that's for me, that to me is is a very outdated, I'm not gonna say a lazy attempt, even though I just said it. Um, it is an, an outdated attempt and it's a, that, that is a signal of not adapting to the circumstances and not adapting to the industry. But that is one part of it. Sometimes data is, in that case, data is probably your priority. In other cases, data is important to you and is something that you should be investing on, but it shouldn't even, it shouldn't be the only thing. Mm -hmm. um, looking, at, looking at attribution and impact holistically is one thing that is really important. And when I'm talking about holistically, I'm talking about Testing, incremental testing, but testing with budgets, testing with your budget testing composition. Exactly. Budgets, audiences, creatives. Yeah, audiences. testing. Of, I mean, ad, advertising is all about testing. Um, and of course, we talk about testing creatives. We mm -hmm. talk, talk, about, talk about testing audiences. We talk about testing all these things. But also, in order to understand the impact, sometimes the only way that you can really do it, or like a really good way to do it, instead of trying to figure out which channel is generating the majority of my conversions, without completely ignoring the fact that all channels generate all of your conversions because people behave on online. People online go through all channels. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't any channel that is, depending on the business, you might have you know, Meta at the, early, at the beginning of the journey and Google towards the end, or you might have Google at the beginning of the journey and Meta towards the end, depending on so many things. Instead of looking at what channel is really the one that I should be investing on, we should be looking at um, we should be looking at incremental testing and testing this kind of stuff. Like for example, if you have a Shopify store or like an e-commerce store and you're running and you're generating revenue, um, 
rather than trying to figure out, I spent two, I'm spending $2,000 a day on Meta and $2,000 a day on Google, which one is generating the top, the majority of conversions when really they overlap. Um, majority of those, of those users are gonna go through both mm -hmm. channels. Plus on top of that, you have a whole lot of conversions and a whole lot of revenue that is coming from additional channels that might complement the advertising ones or might completely be outside the, the marketing mix, your like paid marketing mix. We should be looking at the marketing mix a little bit more. So, you know, you're making $20,000 a day, $200,000 a week. We should be able to look at the bigger picture. We should be able to look at impressions, clicks, and um, spends and conversions reported by each channel and start doing a bit more, starting, start thinking about um, investing into, into testing the composition of these things. Um, and it's as simple as incremental testing sometimes, like what would happen if? Mm -hmm. I don't think we do enough of what would happen if. Yeah, you, you speak a lot about marketing being developing hypotheses and then testing those. That's so, the thing, yes. So it, I mean, we've spoken a lot about data already, but let's say that we get to the stage where we are set up, we have our, our platforms that are tracking data as accurately as possible, then how do you make the most of that new landscape? With what would happen if? Uh, yeah. With, uh, Can you give with me hypothesis. Example well, for example, it, it, for example, it is, I am, um, uh, we're running, Meta, TikTok, Pinterest, Google, Facebook. Um, we have direct, um, not direct, sorry, owned, um, owned channels, emails, and so on. What happened if I would change my budget mix mm -hmm. completely at the beginning of next month? And then I analyze what happened. So I'll take some money off one platform, put it in another platform. I will just change the mix, change the direction of things, and then see what happens afterwards. A lot of what we do is formulating an hypothesis. Mm -hmm. For example, an hypothesis is, I have a lot of YouTube conversions coming from Meta, uh, GA4 is reporting something, TripAware is reporting something else, Meta's reporting something else, Google's reporting something else. Looking at the entire data, looking at the, at the entire data set, and you come up with an hypothesis. And the hypothesis can be anything, but one hypothesis can be, Meta is really early, really, really early in the journey, I get a lot of um, I get a lot of seven day conversions. I get a lot of you of uh, one day conversion. I don't get a lot of one day uh, one day click conversions or last click conversions. I'm looking through I'm looking through all the different attribution settings and models that I have available in my attribution platforms and so on. And I come up with a, with the hypothesis that Meta is probably pushing uh, sorry it's probably prioritizing users very early in their journey, and it's an early touch point channel and Google is really late in my journey. And those two channels are complementing each other from being early and late. And then my second hypothesis is that Pinterest might be, or TikTok might be overlapping in attribution with a lot of my other channels. That's the hypothesis, mm -hmm. you test the hypothesis. Let's take TikTok, but let's have TikTok budget, chuck it into Meta, and let's go and see the impact of that. If I think a lot of incremental and impact, and impact testing has not been done because we're trying to read the data to give us direction towards, to tell us what we should be doing next, mm -hmm. but that data is not fully accurate. Right. Uh, and sometimes the only way to do it is to literally apply the scientific method. I think this might be happening, let me see if that's true. And if that's true, good. If it's not, I go back to the drawing board and do it again. And as I do that, I monitor the entire um, data set that I have. I'm monitoring, again, talking about e-commerce, I'm monitoring my conversion rate, I'm mo monitoring my AOV, I'm, mo I'm monitoring my, the amount of sessions that I'm generating and so on. Um, relying less on tactical and more on strategic. Um, relying less on a technical, tactical approach and more on a strategic approach. Mm -hmm. Tactical means I'm going to test these audiences instead of that or I'm going to split out these uh, product group from that product group. That's good, but that shouldn't be the foundation. Strategic should be, I'm doing that. What I'm trying to prove is this. And if I prove it, I've achieved my goal. If I did not prove it, I still achieved my goal, which was to not prove that and yeah. formulate a different hypothesis. We're really struggling to get that hypothesis formulation 
testing validation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just a mentality thing. And maybe cookie deprecation would change some of that mentality. How, how do you know which is the right area to test? Because you can come up with really infinite hypotheses. You, you can, can, you, you can. Move. Different percentages of budgets from one platform to another. Fair enough, but it, I mean, it's the same. It, 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 the same applies to how do I know what angles to test next or who to test to test next. But, uh, but I would say to that, you can get some level of data from your audience. You can, yes, uh, by, of course. By seeing what language they're using and, and what they resonate with. You can, yeah, yeah. You can do SWOT analysis. You can figure out. You can uh, think about your bias persona. But does that translate to to a data perspective? And yeah, of course. I mean, if we, I think at the end. Um, at the end, um, what we need to remember is that marketers are marketers or digital marketers or digital specialists, whatever we want to call them, our media buyers. Um, we all have a skill set and a toolbox. If you know how to use your toolbox, that is full potential. So you understand any, you, you understand the platform, you understand your attribution, you understand how to read and interpret data. You can come up with hypotheses that actually make sense. Um, so you. Of course, we, you could come up with any hypothesis without being backed by anything. And usually, it can go two ways. You're either looking through data and an hypothesis come up, or you start with an hypothesis and then you look at data to validate that hypothesis. Um, and if you are on the tools and if you're um, actively uh, working on the platform and you, uh, you know your toolbox fully, these ideas come mm. if you are thinking about them. If you're just thinking about a way to maximize my return on ad spend by testing audiences and creatives and not actually understanding how much of that return, how much of that revenue that I'm generating is being, uh, you know, is being attributed from other channels or from other platforms, uh, and you're only thinking tactical, to simplify that, if you're only thinking tactical and you're never, never thinking strategically, um, then you don't you don't get to formulate these hypotheses. You're stuck on the metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, metrics should be numbers that give you a prompt or like an input for you to formulate an hypothesis. Which metrics do you think? Well, right now, and then also in twelve months' time. What metrics are you looking at as the key numbers to facilitate those hypotheses? Because there are, you know, there's hundreds of different. All metrics. of them. It, so I, is it is it return on ad spend? Is it yes or no? Is it uh, average uh, order value. What are, the, what are the three or four that you typically look at straight away? I mean, normally anybody that you would ask the question would say return on ad spend. The reality is that return on ad spend or CPA. The reality is it is a different set of metrics for each business. Mm -hmm. Because if, I, um, if I'm running an e-commerce store that sells, I'm always using the same examples, but like iPhone cases yeah. uh, for $10, it's an impulse buy. Mm -hmm. All I care about is the CPA to be as low as possible, and I'm caring about that CPA to be, I'm, I'm going to be looking at my attribution windows and making sure that it is as close as possible to a single touch point. Because if, if it's costing me more than a few dollars to get that purchase, there's no, there's no point. But if I'm selling furniture, um, then, then my metrics will expand mm -hmm. to dozens of them. Because then it would be very important for me to understand how not only the, the, the purchase, the CPA and the ROAS, but the traffic quality, the stickiness, how long people are staying on it. So you're bringing in other platforms, you're bringing in you know, looking at um, looking at the, the quality of the traffic that you bring in because you're limited by your seven day. Uh, talking about Meta specifically, mm -hmm. you're limited by your seven day conversion window. So, and a lot of the, those conversions might not be happening in that seven days. Um, so it really changes from from business to business. Same as we always you like every marketer that run I me mean every majority of marketers that run e-commerce look at ROAS. Mm -hmm. um, very important to look at because you, at the end, what you can do on the platform is just to be as efficient as, as you can within that platform. Um, and ROAS and CPA are efficiency metrics to tell you how efficiently you're spending your, bu your, your budget. 
too many are stuck on ROAS only though, because the thing with, ROAS, with return on ad spend is um, uh, that it, change, it, it depends on your basket size. Mm -hmm. So like a lot, of our, a lot of clients would have thousands of SKUs from $5 to $150 and all products sell, I wouldn't say evenly, because you're never gonna find somebody that has all their products being sold evenly, but the top sellers might be, the top 50 might be made of all the way from $150 to $5 mm -hmm. range, the entire range, and the AOV could change every single day. In that case, you're, ret you're looking at return on ad spend, optimizing on return on ad spend for something that changes every single day. In that case, then maybe you look at, at CPA mm -hmm. and you have a target CPA based on the campaign and what you're actually promoting in that campaign. But even then, that's all good and that's great for the platform. We should be also looking at what is happening in the business as a whole. We should be looking at um, metrics like no metrics, like um, comparisons like I've spent this much, I've generated this much, what else has happened? I think a lot of the times we look at I've spent this much, I've generated this much, we don't look at anything else. Mm -hmm. We don't actually look at I've spent this much, but how, where, when, what was I promoting, what were the metrics within the platform, and I've generated this much, great, how, what was the AOV, what was the conversion rate, how many items were bought, what was the the, the, your, your final performance, um, what was the, 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 the return rate on that specific day, how many new customers versus returning customers. Not a lot of businesses do that, a lot of marketers do that, mm -hmm. um, but even when we do that, it's always hard to get that message through because again, we, no matter how much we've been talking about privacy, tracking and attribution for years, we are still in a place where for a lot of us in the industry, that is still something that, it's a ghost from the past that is still following us and we're still dealing with it, but we haven't really come to terms with it. We haven't really come to terms that attribution is something that we have to accept to be what it is. Mm -hmm. And we have to be creative. Um, and that's probably because the industry has been methodical for a long time. Like we've been very, a lot of agencies will be very methodical on like, we do this because this works, we do this in a specific way, and there isn't, a lot, there isn't enough creativity or like thinking about alternative ways to do something uh, or challenging you know, ideas or challenging uh, approaches. Um, probably, yeah, we probably just need a little bit more, a little bit more of that. Mm, yeah, it sounds like, I know we've gone very deep into data and attribution yeah. and, and the, yeah, the science behind it. But fundamentally, the, for me, it, it just comes down to asking more questions, testing out more ideas and thinking outside the box a little bit because all, or the majority of marketers and the majority of businesses are doing things as they were years ago, right? So, yeah, um, so it's about innovating. Well, they seem like they have updated. Uh, with, it seems like the industry is uh, updating in certain ways, but not updating in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, it is about asking the. Uh, it, it is about asking questions. It's also about asking the right questions. Um, are like, there any? What are the wrong questions right now? <laughs> well, one of the questions that gets asked. Uh, uh, one of the questions that it's always really hard to answer is. I think this is probably a thing that any marketer would would say, um, and it is what I was saying before. What channel is making me more money? Mm -hmm. That is the wrong question to ask. How would um, you re rephrase that into the right question for someone who's looking at that? If, how if I'm your, looking at my store, you should be looking at your marketing mix as okay. a whole. Because um, like I always have the same example of like when I explain attribution to like um, to new people, to newbies, or to the to to, to people that are getting through the, the training at the beginning, the mm -hmm. basics of media buying and uh, buying, and you talk about attribution. I always compare it to like a love story. Mm -hmm. There's this like I have this presentation that I, I continue. continue <laughs> I continue recycling, uh, where there's like these two people that meet and then uh, they meet at a party and then they go to. Um, the, 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 they go to an event together and they meet again and then they get texting, they decide to go out on a date, go out on a date, a few days after or a few weeks after they have the first kiss, all the way down to getting married. And the question at the end of that session is, or of that you know, 10 minutes or five minutes story is, um, where do you think these guys fell in love? Uh, and, and obviously the answers are all over the place. It could have been the first date, the second date, the fifth date, the 15th date, or it could be when they met in the first time, or maybe they never fell in love. <laughs> Unlucky for them. <laughs> um, 
And when I explain that in like those simple everyday terms, then people start to understand what attribution really means. Um, the, re the, the thing is, there isn't a right way to ask the question. That's just that's just not the not not a right question to ask, mm -hmm. because just think about think about the way you behave on the uh, on on the web online. Do you see a product on Facebook, click on it and buy? Sometimes it had it has happened to me once that I saw something and I just bought it. What, I don't know what happened what to me because I never a t-shirt. You don't seem like an impulse person. No, at person, all. Kind of Not at all. I was just, yeah. I was, I wanted to buy something new. I was in a shopping mode. I couldn't find anything on the Iconic, couldn't find anything on Asus. Mm -hmm. I got like, I was, I want something new, but I want to, I don't want to look for it. And I saw this t-shirt and it looked good and I bought it. It was once in a lifetime. Also, because I never buy online first impulse. Plus, it was weird because it was like a certain price. And then when I got to the checkout, I realized that I was paid in U in US dollar, so it was like way more expensive, and I still bought it. So I don't know what happened that <laughs> day because then ad. that never happened Maybe they were to me. But it was a good ad, yeah, it was a good ad. Um, but normally people don't behave like that. Normally people go through multiple channels, keep their tabs open, keep their tabs open on mobile, go back to their tabs, have like all these million tabs open, go back to something, yeah. um, or they just stop and then think about it again, search it again, search your brand, search a competitor, search the product, even after they've seen the ad multiple times, and then they might convert from any of these channels. But there is no way to say for certain when did this user come up, when, when was this user exposed to your brand the first time? When was that user exposed to the brand in a way that made them choose that that was a good brand for them, that was a choice for them. When did they move from that stage to the next stage where they were choosing a product on your site? And when did they finally complete it? Plus everything in the middle. There is no way to say that. So really that's a question that hasn't got an answer. Mm -hmm. The reality is all your channels are important in different ways. It's all about understanding how do you leverage those channels and again, Hypothesis, hypothesis, testing, validation, and understand what the impact of these challenges are. And sometimes that also means investing budget into a certain test mm -hmm. to a certain channel. Budget testing, incremental testing. Incremental testing is another overused term um, to see what the impact really is. And, and once that testing is completed, look at what else has happened. Um, did your CPM change? Did your click-through rate change? Did your, um, did, did your marketing mix change? Did so many things. We usually don't do that because we look at, we, sorry, no, we usually don't do that. A lot of businesses don't do that because they're stuck on uh, looking at the single metric. Like you, nine e-commerce out of 10, they will run their business based on a single metric, which is MER, mm -hmm. and ignore everything else. Or everything else, look at everything else as a, as a, as a way to justify the MER. Do you um, think that that is a workable strategy for some businesses, say smaller businesses who don't have well, if I'm look, marketing channels? Yeah, if you're looking at MER and you're running your business off MER only, you need to be small. Because mm -hmm. that means that you need to know for, for, for a fact that 80-90% of your revenue are generated from paid. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think it gets to a certain point in your business revenue journey where you need to move away from looking yes. at one thing yeah, to, there's to a, everything? Yeah, there's a midpoint. There's like there's a stage where MER is really good because you have no lifetime value, uh, no one knows you, uh, you're complete, you're totally in the in the top um, in the top of the funnel because no one knows you, so you have you don't have brand recognition, um, you you don't have referrals, you don't have any organic. You don't have direct, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. And all you have is your social media, hoping that it sticks, and your ads, and then maybe you run um, influencer marketing mm -hmm. or, refer or anything like that. That's where you can look at MER, because you know that that's the biggest investment that you have in your marketing, and that's the biggest thing, the biggest, whatever return you have, one way or another will be influenced by it. Mm -hmm. uh, will be influenced, even your, um, your ambassadors or influencers will still be influenced by um, your paid. Then there's a midpoint where your marketing mix starts, which again, 
could change. You know, it could be that midpoint at ten thousand dollars a month or at hundred thousand thousand dollars a month. It really depends on what again what you're selling and how quickly you scale, how quickly you you but get it. Somewhere you get in between to that. ten and hundred usually. Well, there's something. That, well, that's a massive. Yeah. <laughs> that is a massive range. Yeah, it is, but but it's, it is a huge you know, it's range. Not, it's not saying wait till you get to a million and then look because really usually you get look. to that midpoint. You 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 under, you see when you get into that point because you're starting to have a decent return rate which means customers are coming back to buy on the site. Um, you have a bigger database of emails that are starting to actually engage and convert. And you're starting to get, you're looking at any attribution, even just simply looking at GA4, you're having referral traffic. Uh, sorry, you're having direct traffic, you're having organic traffic, and you're having traffic directly from social media, which means your marketing mix has expanded. Once you start seeing that your marketing mix has expanded, the Meta and Google make up for 40% of it or 30% of, of the sessions on your site. Mm -hmm. That's where you probably start, need to start thinking about moving away from only MER, using MER as a benchmark rather than a goal. Um, because if you're looking at MER as a goal, that goalpost will move based on, first of all, based on anything else outside the ads and on, uh, on seasonality, how, many, how much money you're making, like how much revenue you're generating, um, and what else is performing outside the marketing mix. Mm -hmm. uh, m most of the time when we're looking at MER, we're playing catch up. <clears throat> so we're looking at like, the perfect example of running a sale is that we, um, a, a brand will have a sale, launch a campaign at a certain spend, the MER goes up because the sale performs well, the spend follows, and we're actually following the spend. We're following the revenue with spend mm -hmm. rather than doing the opposite, which is spending a whole lot and then generate as much as, and then figure out based on how much we generated, what were the metrics that made for that revenue, and then find ways to replicate that or find gaps that we might have to fix or sort out for the next sale. Um, MER is always, at that point, is always a catch-up, uh, a catch-up, um, like, a catch-up. We're always catching up yeah. to, follow, yeah. to follow other trends. Um, and the problem with that is, again, MER is made, sorry, your revenue, your total revenue are made by so many channels that you do not control with ads, that if you're looking at MER and your, um, your organic direct referral and all the other external channels, plus your, your return rate and the, your own marketing channels perform differently and fluctuate a lot, your MER will fluctuate a lot. Mm -hmm. If you're chasing a certain MER goal, you might be under-optimizing when the MER is high and over-optimizing when the MER is low, mm -hmm. and you never reach a stability point where you're actually able to scale because you're just constantly going up and down. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Classic thing is things are good, scale up, they stop being, being that good because you scale up and your MER drops, stop scaling, pull back. And then you keep going up and down, you keep getting into the loop and you never actually scale. When instead, if you're looking at MER as, this is my benchmark. You know, my MER for the year, last year or for the last three months, for the last six months, again, depending on the business, has been this. And it has been this, looking at all the different peaks. It's gone up and down because it's gone, because my conversion rate's gone up and down, because I had a sale, because I sent out an email, because I sent out an SMS, because mm -hmm. that specific content's gone viral. That is my number. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to try to be. And I'm going to scale, I'm going to spend, and I'm going to monitor it. And if I spend and it drops, I'm going to go and figure out why. Because if I'm spending up and I am not generating more revenue, there can be so many, so many reasons. If the MER drops, it doesn't necessarily always have to be because of the ads. Mm -hmm. Actually, most of the times, it's not. Most of the times, nothing has changed in your ads. Because really, your CPMs will change, but it won't go from, $30, from $10 to $30 overnight. Um, your click-through rate will change, but it won't go from 1.5 to, to 0 0.10 overnight. Nothing changes overnight. Um, a lot of things that change when your revenue goes up and down is because your marketing mix has changed. Mm -hmm. It's because your, a lot of other channels have been performing differently. And sometimes it can be a symptom of something that has been happening paid because usually when brands scale down is when things start to get worse, when they're going from bigger to, work, to, to smaller. Because you're, as you expose less people to your brand, obviously you're generating less of everything else. So you're generating less direct, less organic, less referral, less, less of uh, any other channel. 
Um, being able to look at that, that's, that's, that's very similar to what I'm saying, look at the bigger picture or look at it organically. Like understand every single component of my business rather than be stuck on, I need an eight MER because, um, because that's what I need. Yeah. Like, and, uh, and if I don't get it, I scale back. Mm -hmm. I want to take everything that you just said about MER and metrics and what we should look at and thinking about the bigger picture. And just tell me if, if I were a business owner and I was spending, say, let's say I'm spending 20K per month on meta ads, how should I be looking at my data points in order to protect myself for the changes that are coming in the world of data over the next 12 months? Um, well, independently from how much you're spending, you should be um, working with somebody that you, that first of all, understands their tool. Um, there's a lot of media buyers that don't even know what match quality is or don't really understand attribution fully. Mm -hmm. I, I, I go to events from time to time or I talk to other people in the industry or I get on LinkedIn and I see a lot of uh, people still talking in a way that completely ignores more than attribution. Mm -hmm. um, so just first of all, making sure that whoever you're working with, and again, we work in an agency, so agency, but whoever you're working with, including your own team, is up to date, understands more than attribution, understands um, the importance of data, and understands how to understand, uh, how to see if data is um, is qualitative. Mm -hmm. uh, check your match quality. Check your um, check your data sources. Check if your data tracking solutions are up to date or are or are as up to date as your resources allow. Um, and that is just to make sure that you're prepare, you're safe. And not only you're prepared for anything that might happen in the future, but you're also up to date with things that have happened already. Um, and then second is get your numbers in order, meaning get a grasp of all these numbers. Um, if you, whatever business you run, uh, again, if you're in e-commerce or if you're uh, uh, like a service business, you need to know the numbers and the metrics that make up for your business. Like you need to be an e-commerce brand, you need to understand your conversion rate and why it fluctuates, your AOV, why it fluctuates, um, your, the, the, the performance of certain products in certain seasonalities or in certain periods of the year or in certain, uh, in certain uh, groups of demographics. Understand your buyer persona, understand, um, understand why things happen in your store. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the time uh, businesses figure out these things by working with an agency. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding all this is probably the first thing. Otherwise, the risk is that you're looking at the wrong metric. You might be looking at MER when your problem is AOV. You might be looking at um, CPA when your problem is your conversion rate. And maybe it's as basic as the, there's friction points that you haven't identified on your site. Um, making, making sure that you've got all the metrics and all the number you're aware of what's happening and you know what is going on. Mm -hmm. You've got your cost under management, under control. You've got your fixed cost, your variable cost under control. you got all of your uh, business metrics are, your bookkeeping is done well. Mm -hmm. If your bookkeeping is done well, you've got solid data that you invest in to make sure that the data is correct. And when all that is done, then you've got the foundation. And then the next step is Zoom out, zoom out to the single channels, zoom out to the single or the single performance, the CPAs and the ROAS, and start looking at your business as a whole. Um, Facebook, yes, meta, very important. Too much time we focus on one. R the reality is that people come on your site from multiple cha multiple channels. All of these channels have a certain level of importance. We need to be looking at the marketing mix, right. the entire marketing mix and the entire performance. Um, yeah. T tying it back to that first point you said about making sure that whoever is doing your media buying and, and data tracking understands the right metrics and how to read everything properly. Do you have two, three or four questions that someone, a business owner could ask their media buyer or their in-house team or their agency just to understand whether or not they're actually up to date with the technology and up to date with the tracking because I think it's so important for people to be able to trust 
that whoever's handling their data knows what they're doing. But mm. if for me, if I don't know how data works and you're running my ads, you're the expert in my eyes. How do I know that you're actually the expert compared to everyone else and, and are up to date with what's happening? That's a good question. Um, I guess, I think a lot of that is, the, is in the pitch process um, and what you're, what you're being told or what you've been pitched in the first place. Um, you probably wanna make sure that you're not working with anybody that claims. First of all, I, I would say my first thing is, this is probably, again, a very philosophical answer to a very simple question, but you wanna be working with people that don't, that don't sell you uh, um, uh, like um, a solution or a method or a packaged approach or a, a truth. You wanna be working with people that when they're talking to you, they're talking about testing, they're talking about um, experimentation, mm -hmm. they're talking about making hypotheses, people that have the creativity, and you can see that when you're working with someone, because if you're, if you're talking to an agency and it is all about, um, it is all about, um, we do this because it's a proven approach or this is the way that we do things and so on, it's it's very typical. It's a very um, it <clears throat> it's a it's a very typical thing that happens. Like it, it is a very um, it's a very common approach. When you're working with agencies that when we're working with people that actually are solution first, solution um, oriented, and they are thinking about they are creative and they're thinking about testing and so on, they'll mention that all over their pitch their pitch deck, their onboarding process, and everything else. It's always going to be all about testing. And you probably want to look for these signals and for these mm -hmm. green and red flags. So, so you would more, rather than ask them about the data or the metrics, you would ask them how they would solve problems. You would ask them about their ideas for creative testing, their ideas for innovating in your account and your business as a whole and, and try to see the way they think rather than the... Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, like, uh, you know, every whenever you engage with an agency, it, it all starts with, most of the time, it starts with an audit. Mm. Um, and the audit will be very tactical. That's fine. The audit will be tactical. It needs to be tactical. But once you get into the process, if it's all about the audit, if it's all about improving a certain metric, or if it's all about making sure that Meta generates the right amount of revenue and so on, um, you, it, it, be, it will be quite clear that the agency is very methodical and, mm -hmm. very, um, and very platform based. While, very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but, but I, I agree with you because I think that marketing and digital marketing to the, to the next degree is constantly changing. Now we're talking about cookie-less world, but in three months' time, we'll be speaking a lot about AI, and then five years ago, we were speaking about- Yeah, TikTok. exactly. There's always, there's always something new. So I think that when you are working with someone to try and grow your brand, whether it's in terms of marketing or any other aspect of your business, you really have to understand that they are able and willing to adapt and grow and learn. Because I think that's the main thing, yeah. in their ways, then they'll be outdated very soon. I think that's the main thing is, uh, um, and again, it's very hard to say, like to give you a, um, like, um, uh, a list of questions that you because can Because those ask. questions will be outdated in a month, right? Because yeah. exactly, and also like, it's, it's very hard to come up with actual questions, but yeah. um, it's all about the approach. If yeah. the approach is methodical, then you're stuck. If yeah. the approach is um, curious, then you wanna go for curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, things change all the time. You th change. Even the things that we talk about change all the time. Like, no one spoke about cookies, and then everyone spoke about cookies, and then no one spoke, spoke, spoke about cookies again. Mm -hmm. Like, because it was happening, then it's not happening, then it was happening, and now it's maybe not happening. It changes all the time, and then AI, we all spoke about AI, then it kind of went flat for a bit, and now we're all talking about AI again, now we're over talking about AI, because mm -hmm. now everything is AI out of a sudden. As long as your platform does more than one thing, it just becomes AI. Um, and uh, it changes all the time. You just need to be adapted to that. If your marketing strategy comes to you with an idea, and then three months afterwards comes to you completely challenging that idea with something that has got 
that is makes sense, first of all, but it makes sense and it's completely against everything that he's been telling you three months ago, you're probably working with the right person. You're, pro you're working with someone. That sounds like the right person. Yeah, you're working with someone that is challenging what they're doing and they're looking for new solutions, mm -hmm. um, no matter if it works or not. And, and they're throwing ego out the window and they're just doing what's best yeah, for the brand. You, yeah, exactly. You're working with someone that is not afraid of challenging what they've been saying or what they've been doing. Because, I mean, it's not a lot of the things that businesses are doing today are wrong. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's just you know, new approaches or new yeah, ways to yeah, look at totally. things uh, that we have not been thinking about. Uh, a couple of years ago, you would run Facebook ads. And well, frankly, during COVID, you could run uh, anything on Facebook ads. And one way or another, it will work. You know, like a lot of, that's probably, the, that was the boom of agencies as well. Um, you would run things as long as you had a decent product, a decent offering and a good, you know, a, a good positioning in the market and your ads were absolute trash, you would run like, and, and things would work. Mm -hmm. Of course, they could have worked a lot better. You, know, you could work with agency A or agency B and get two completely different results, but you wouldn't get zero results. You would still get something. Then things change and evolved, and a lot of it's it's a lot harder to catch up on those things. Um, and um, yeah, just you need to make sure. I think every brand should be they should be updated updating themselves first. And again, it takes nothing. There's newsletters. There's there's um, publications. There's YouTube channels and so on. Like just you, just quickly while you're on that, do you have? Any recommendations and like really good resources, newsletters, publications? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm on a bunch. <laughs> yeah. um, personally, it's easier here, it's easier being in an agency because we get things firsthand from Google, from Meta, from mm -hmm. TikTok, from Pinterest. So there's less need to be updated. Um, but just get on LinkedIn. Yeah. Get on LinkedIn, follow a bunch of people, and from there you get exposed to a bunch of other people. Just you know, follow um, follow people that are on the tools every day. Um, you know, C CEOs and C and C C roles very important. Uh, but also follow people that are a little bit below. If you, if you follow the head of performances and so on, and just see the different projects. Like I'm on LinkedIn once a day. I don't love it, but I you kind of have to at some point in your career. Uh, and I can see so many things. Like well, you would have on LinkedIn, I'm sure. Huh? <laughs> this will be posted. This will be on LinkedIn for sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can see two, three, ten, twenty people talking about the exact same thing in ten different ways. Yeah. And they're all fine. They're all correct and they're all wrong at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the point of it. Um, if brands are spending some time to just staying updated on what's happening, then they can figure out if the agency is falling back or if the agency is following the trends, is making sure that we stay on top of things. Um, and testing out stuff. Like It doesn't mean that a brand needs to know attribution, understand attribution 100%. But also, you know, part of that, yes. Like, even if you work with an agency, um, if you invest some of your... 5% of your time to educate yourself on what is on, on the industry and on the basics of it. And some of the education can come directly from your account manager mm -hmm. at the agency. It would be a lot easier to have a relationship with the agency. It would be a lot easier to get things done and to think creatively. Um, rather than, And maybe instead of being a roadblock for your own growth, you can be the the starting point of that growth mm -hmm. um, and maybe start realizing that a lot of the times a lot of the decisions that brands are taking are ego driven uh, or they are driven by the fact that you know that's a passion that's something that they really care about that they're something that they're really interested their product is something that they're really interested about and they are unable to think objectively so spending five percent of your time one hour a day to educate yourself um, can really make you open your eyes on certain things and on the fact that maybe you've been looking at that completely wrong. Yeah, I definitely um, agree. I think regardless of what profession you're in, just invest in learning and, and that compounds greater than anything else. We do this every day here as well. Like, you know, you're might be running something in a certain way forever mm -hmm. and then you realize that maybe that wasn't working, you tried something else, or maybe you realize that it was working and that could be the foundation for something new. Mm -hmm. um, you do it either ways. And of course, sometimes you're you know, in any business, in any industry, same as you know, in, uh, when you relate to others in an agency or your own team, 
so some change might not be or some ideas might not be welcome and some you know there's there's always there's always something negative about change um but in this industry change is inevitable and if it change needs to be embraced mm -hmm. like we need to think about there needs to be something happening new every day um and if independently if it's working or not um and more understanding why things are working and why things are not working. Yeah. Very important, understanding when things are working. We spend so much time to try to figure out when things are not working, but we never understand why they are working. And then we don't maximize opportunities. And we try to figure out, we try always looking at the problem when it's a problem. When a lot of the times when we're looking at things when they are working, we can figure out problems before they become problems. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Love it. Well, a lot of things to think about for me. You've certainly shared a lot of value. And a lot of tangents. A lot of tangents. Oh, that's what it's but all that's about. That's me, though. though. Yeah, like, I, I do go on tangents. But it wouldn't be a conversation <laughs> about the future of marketing without touching tangents. on AI. So oh, yeah. It is, it is getting dark outside. We are going to go home soon. Um, but just quickly, in, in a minute or two, can you tell me where you think AI is going to influence marketing? Is it something that we should actually implement? Is it something that is more of a fad, more of a buzzword? Where do you see it all going? And, and I guess the second half of that question is, what actually is AI in marketing? Because it is such a big word and there are so many little pockets of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the first question, the, sorry, the second question first, AI in marketing is, is just AI. AI, it's, um, it's a technology, it's a language model. So AI marketing means content creatives, uh, performance optimization, um, it means data analysis, it means statistical measurements, attribution. AI is just everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of should we, should we not, I had, a, uh, I had a few different conversations over the last few months with different people that have very different points of view. And, I, did, I do notice that there's two completely different approaches. There's I love it and I overuse it and I overdo it or I hate it and I don't want to have anything to deal with it. And when, when uh, you say I love it and I use it, is that in the sense of giving recommendations for your, your data or...? No, I'm saying I love it and I use it as I'm embracing it or I'm not embracing it. Yeah, but, uh, but my question is like how... These people, how are they embracing it? Are they using like one piece of software? Or, yeah, or I mean, in in our case, <laughs> <laughs> oops. Um, when I talk to people, I talk to people outside the agency. Um, at Megaphone, we are embracing it. We're embracing it fully, uh, and obviously, I mean, we we're bringing in um, fixes. We not even a partnership, we've been acquired by Pixis, but um, we are working with Pixis to use AI um, with, within uh, performance um, optimization, data analysis, but also creative mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. We, we have so many tools. Um, we have, we're, moving, we're moving through the performance part of things now, so we are getting all the accounts into the performance AI, uh, looking at the recommendation, looking at how they are um, how the platform and the AI is telling us to move. Uh, and then slowly we are testing out about 12 different tools um, that we are going to roll out a little bit at a time. So we are on the side of those that are embracing it. Um, independently from like, is it going to be, is it a fed or not? Or is it something that is going to stay or not? It doesn't matter. Um, it is a reality. Um, it could be it could be solid and it could be something that continues evolving or it could be not, but that's the point of it. It's like whatever is here today might not be here tomorrow or might be in a different way. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to be on it anyways. We have to be on top of it and we have to embrace anything. And again, if you are working with someone, if you, um, your mentality is all about curiosity, it's all about experimentation, it's all about... Um, hypotheses and testing and, and, and just staying on top of trends and trying things out, then you will, normally, you will jump on it. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll jump on it in every single form and, and, and chance. There was, um, there was, I don't remember what events it was, um, it could have been a Google one, but I'm not sure, uh, where 
there was like a prediction, again, no, no idea where they're getting the predictions from, but there was a prediction that a certain percentage, at the, like a big number, don't know the number, don't remember the number, number on but like big here. number <laughs> of, um, of uh, advertiser, uh, sorry, of creatives on advertising platforms or like on social media and ads and so on will be AI generated mm -hmm. um, in like 2025. Again, that's probably, probably means nothing. That's probably pulled out of thin air, but there is a lot more happening. Uh, there is a lot more AI being generated. I mean, there's, there's companies that have influencers all completely AI generated yeah. and they are yeah. selling the influencer services that they're selling you the ability to have your product sold by a AI generated influencer. Um, so, I mean, it is happening. So, I mean, if we don't want to embrace it, usually for me, it's, for me, it's just uh, people that when we don't want to embrace it, it's, um, it's just because we're looking at it in the wrong way. Mm. You know, like definitely it's not perfect. You know, yeah. I can say, you, you know, I have interactions with ChatGPT every day, and I know, and, and ChatGPT, perplexity, meta AI, um, AI create, creative generation tools, the Google AI suggested ad uh, um, headlines and descriptions in the ad, the meta AI generated one. I have interactions with these daily, all the time. The Photoshop AI thing that. We like to that play with it. We like yeah. to play it late at night. Uh, like interact with all these, and there's a percentage of things that come out of that that are not, you know, they're not quality, they're not good, and so on. But so what? It's there's also percentage that are, and there's also percentage that are in the middle. Um, and it's all about the way we use it. I feel like again, uh, a lot of marketing, a lot of the digital marketing industry is uh, is too transactional. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the same way as we're looking at, I put a thousand dollars, I get. $10,000 back and my ROAS is 10 times, um, which is way too simplistic. We are all, we're looking at AI sometimes in the same way as like, this is my prompt. I'm expecting uh, like a masterpiece to come out of this. When in reality, sometimes AI can just be a tool that we use yeah. in the right ways, in the right situations. Sometimes it's not the right moment to use it. Sometimes it's not the right way to use it. Or sometimes you just use it to just, um, to just do something um, in you know a, a more creative way or a different way or like um, uh, like almost like as an assistant, someone that you're still training, someone that is not perfect, will make a lot of mistakes, but will also get the job done from time to time. Um, so it's it's just about jumping onto these things, um, and luckily we have that curiosity uh, here. So we are exposed to an AI platform currently, and we're testing a lot of it. Well, Steph, I think we'll. Wrap it up there because it's night time and we're, it getting, is. we're getting hungry. But I'm sure we could have gone on for hours and we've only scratched the surface of AI and and cookieless worlds and data and metrics and everything in between. So I appreciate your time and to all of our viewers. Hopefully they got some value out of this. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully there weren't too many tangents. And uh, um, we'll be back again whether they watch or not. But uh, yeah, thank you for right. joining me. Really appreciate it, man. And, thank uh, you. Until next time, eh? Thank you. You can uh, take the mic off and Did you finish your Oreos. I have finished my Oreos. Yeah. No, no more Oreos for me. I am um, <laughs> controlling. I can't. I with can't. baby, with a small baby, I can't go to the gym or like do everything as much, so I have to be very careful. Mm. Alright, cool. Oh, this is a different camera.